Hey everybody, welcome to Wheels Through Time Museum. It's Saturday, April 8th. It's our opening day or opening weekend right here at Wheels Through Time for the 2023 season. And today is our inaugural Founders Day event. So uh, today is the day that we're all gathering together here to celebrate the life and the work of our founder, uh, Dale Waxler. So as we speak right now, we're right in the new exhibit celebrating Dale and it's called the King of Old Motorcycles. Uh, many of us uh, here at the museum uh, and across the United States, around the world, have been inspired by our founder Dale, my dad, uh, to get into antique motorcycles, help promote the hobby like nobody else and uh, as you guys know, uh, was the creator of everything here at Wheels Through Time. So today is our day that we're celebrating Dale's life and his work, and we've got some really special stuff planned for you here today. So we're gonna be firing up several of Dale's favorite motorcycles here in the museum, uh, several of the machines that were really kind of critical throughout time periods of the development of Wheels Through Time here at the museum. So in the exhibit, if you guys haven't been to the museum before, of the periods that were kind of instrumental uh, in Dale's life and creating the Wheels Through Time Museum. So starting as a, a, a young kid, uh, 20, 20 something years old, 23 years old, he bought his Harley Davidson dealership, began collecting old motorcycles and 50, 60 something years later, uh, here we are at Wheels Through Time today. So incredible day, we've got an awesome crowd. It's our third day open this week, guys. So third day open this season, and it's been a great couple days so far. We're excited to crank up some incredible motorcycles for you here at the museum. 375 of the world's rarest motorcycles. And as you guys know, everything in the building cranks up and runs. So we've got some really special bikes. I hope we can grab a, a, a crew of people to tag along with us and hear some of this history run. Uh, one of my favorite motorcycles in the place period in the whole museum is this 1917 Henderson uh, inside the exhibit here a lot of bikes that were special to my dad this one perhaps more special uh, this bike might have been more special to him than about any of the other motorcycles here now if you had a chance to tune in several weeks ago maybe about a month and a half ago we actually did a full feature on this bike the 1917 Henderson 24-hour endurance racer so the bike at hand, one-of-a-kind motorcycle, and as you guys know, there are one-of-a-kind bikes scattered throughout the museum. Uh, this bike, one of my favorites. So 1917, Henderson revamped their game and created a new transmission and, and basically continued to, to reinvent uh, the luxury American motorcycle. This bike here in front of us, one of a kind bike. It was specially built for a fellow named Maldwin Jones to run a 24 hour endurance run uh, on the Cincinnati board track. So traditionally what happens when manufacturers create a new piece of equipment, they go out to setting records. So this bike was actually produced, you guys can hear, always live here at the museum. Things happen nonstop. That's the 1932 Model B dirt track racer. Andy's firing it up for visitors over there, making noise. And uh, so the 17 here, incredible bike, didn't end up setting the record for the 24 hour run. So they built this bike specially to set that record at the time. It was 1175 miles or 1125 miles um, uh, set by Harley Davidson at the time on their new J model, the Giant 17. So Henderson jumps into the ball game tries to set that record and ends up coming up short. They were on track to beat the record. Uh, the bike ended up, or excuse me, uh, uh, the crew ended up moving one of the, the, basically had big candles lighting the track. This guy ended up crashing the bike and it laid up for about 75 years. And the bike never finished the run, laid up all those years. My dad found this bike at the Wasion Antique Bike Meet. Uh, bought it from a good friend of his, Dave Leitner, restored it, and then he actually jumped on this bike and rode it 3,300 miles coast to coast, uh, setting or re-breaking a record that was set on a really similar bike in 1917. So he probably has, of all the bikes in this whole museum, I think he probably has more miles on this motorcycle than just about anything in here. It absolutely runs like a watch. The bike was restored by our good friend Steve Hunsinger, and uh, Steve 
a good pal of ours, Stuart Munger, who's no longer with us, uh, and myself were in the pit van uh, back in 1997, helping my dad get this thing across country and um, runs as good today as it did back then in 97 and as good as it did in 1917. So we're gonna kick this off by firing this thing up. Usually I spin the rear wheel on this thing, but today we're gonna kick start it. Um, kick her over on the left side. Now this is a thousand cc's, it's three speeds, mild compression, uh, but the inline four cylinders, we always say that uh, half the bore, half the stroke, twice as many chances for it to fire up. They're notoriously easy starters, incredible even power. Uh, this one being a racing engine makes some noise like none of the other Hendersons out there. So we're gonna go ahead and give this thing a couple prime kicks, and hopefully one to go. smooth so a lot of you guys have noticed that big carburetor hanging out the side completely impractical you know not where it needs to be the reason they did that Henderson this is the only manifold like this in the world and this, Henderson traditionally had the carburetor way back here idle this thing down So the Henderson manifold usually stuck back here in the race job. They actually set it up to split the difference and uh, hangs out there in the way of your leg, but much better airflow, much better fuel flow, and uh, better performance. See everything working down there, dude? Yeah, let me tip it up for you. So there you guys have it, 1917 Henderson 24 hour endurance racer. Uh, really, really special bike here at the museum. This place is filled with some of the rarest motorcycles anywhere. I know a lot of you guys that ride bikes know that the more seat time you put on one, the closer you get with it. And this bike was uh, one of those bikes that my dad rode, rode often, rode all the time and uh, loved as much as just about anything in the building. So. So the museum here is 50 plus years in the making this place. Um, started collecting when he was a kid and uh, dating back really all the way 15, 16 years old. Got the bug for American motorcycles. Bought his first Harley Davidson at the age of 15. He was uh, on his way to school and actually passed by this old Harley trike. Finally got the nerve up to the f uh, c confront the folks that owned it and the bike was run into a tree. So it was all mangled up. He actually had the thing loaded on the back of a truck and delivered back to his place. Uh, spent about a month in the garage and this is, what, uh, this is what rolled out. So first motorcycle was a Harley Davidson trike. This is a 1957 model. And this bike was his only transportation for like eight or nine years. So rode the thing all the time managed to keep it all of that time and uh, again one of the more special bikes here in the museum this is really what started wheels through time guys so dale collected for 52 years uh, passed away actually february 3rd 2021 uh, at the age of 68 far too young and uh, he had a lot of work left to do you know he was the engine behind this place he was uh, the, the guy that made these wheels roll and, uh, you know, uh, really touched and affected a lot of people, which is why today we decided to make our, uh, 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 on our opening weekend, Saturday, um, our inaugural Founders Day. So I appreciate everybody tagging along and hanging and coming to the museum today. How many of you guys have been here to the museum before? 
first, first, lot of pe first time first people, time. first time people, and then so it, you guys were here yesterday for the first time. Yeah. Awesome, awesome guys. Well, appreciate you being here. We wouldn't be able to do what we do without our great visitors. We got the best visitors in the world, and and uh, you know it's our very best uh, mission here to get people inspired about old motorcycles. And uh, I can't thank you guys all enough for coming. And as you guys know, this is the museum that runs. So when you're hanging out today, you're gonna hear motorcycles run throughout the day. Uh, earliest motorcycle here at the museum is a 1903 Indian. Still runs, as we know it, it's the world's oldest running Indian. And the collection really spans all the way through about 19, mid 1980s or so. There's a few bikes from a little bit later, but the breadth of the collection is probably pre-1970 stuff, and the focus here is rare motorcycles. Uh, bikes with personality and bikes with great stories. As you guys know, the story is what makes this stuff what it is. Uh, without that part of it, without the human element, it's all just metal. Um, so the story, it's some of the stuff that we dig the most, and the bikes in here, some of the stories almost unbelievable stories like you won't hear anywhere else so uh the trike here we fire this bike every single day here at the museum now third day open so it's only been fired a couple times since last season uh the bike's a 45 cubic inch 1957 survey car uh, my pops used to jump on this bike inside the museum and like throw somebody on the back and go ride around and do wheelies inside and uh, yeah some of the stuff that that he did the best uh, so 1957 Harley survey car we'll see if this thing fires up with a couple kicks and let's uh, let's go here one prime kick one to go out of gas <laughs> all right well, guys there you have it um, the motorcycle that started it all right here inside the museum so like I was telling y'all a lot of the motorcycles in here are from particularly special times throughout my dad's life uh, some of his first motorcycles actually the 1913 Harley over that way is the first old old motorcycle that he actually uh, ended up finding, bought that from the Harley Davidson dealer that he ended up buying his dealership from. The 1909 right behind you guys up on the table there, that bike he always kind of considered his holy grail. So uh, 1909, that's like the, what, the fifth or sixth year for the Harley Davidson Motor Company. That's a rare uh, kind of prototype example. That's the first Harley with the Magneto ignition ultra rare 26 inch model. They made big and small models back then. So while the engine was the same size, they made some with bigger wheels, some with smaller wheels. The smaller models had, everything was smaller than a normal bike. So 80%, maybe 85% of the size. So the fork was shorter, the frame was smaller, the gas tanks were skinnier. Um, this is the only model known like this in the world today. Uh, chased it for years and years. This bike was in the EJ Cole collection uh, up in South Dakota uh, and was sold at the EJ Cole auction. And uh, my dad was actually up there, uh, saw the bike go, uh, didn't end up buying it then and actually worked years later uh, a deal with his good friend Vince Martinico to to bring the collector, bring the motorcycle here to wheels through time. So, uh, very special bikes. And now, as you go on further, there's some great information on the storyboards here that kind of tell you all about Dale's life and all about the motorcycles that have made it here to wheels through time. So, um, 
you know, quite a life it was. And, and again, 50 plus years of collecting and uh, none of us would be standing here today if it wasn't uh, for all of that hard work that he put together. So all sorts of things happening here at Wheels Through Time this weekend on Founders Day. We're actually blessed with the presence of our super good friend, David Ewell. Uh, David is a world-renowned artist, one of the creators of some of the best Harley Davidson artwork in the world. Here at the museum, we've been fortunate enough to work with Dave for years and years, uh, helping him to create some of the neatest pieces that there are. Dave's got a full gallery set up uh, here at, at the museum this weekend with a lot of his pieces that he's created over the years. So David started painting in about 1998 uh, for Harley Davidson and has created some of the most iconic artwork, period. Uh, so he's got the full gallery set up this weekend. You can see a lot of the pieces uh, that Wheels Through Time has helped him create and then dozens more uh, that you, this is stuff that you can't see anywhere else in the world. So we got David right over here. We're gonna try and get a word with him if he's got a, a spare moment. So, Dave, how are you doing? Good, man. How are you doing? Great. Great to have you here this weekend. Oh, I love being here. It's my favorite spot in the world. <laughs> favorite spot. It's I mean, awesome my brain just say. goes, oh, God. Oh, man. <laughs> I, see, I see images, you know, of what, what that could be with well, all these old bikes. There's been a lot of stuff in here that you've, that you've painted and immortalized, man. <laughs> yeah, it's a little scary to see. <laughs> I'm starting to feel as old as these bikes now. <laughs> so, what, so one of the questions I wanted to ask you is, like, what... What drew you to this place, and how did you and my dad connect way back? Boy, that's a really tough question. You know, I think the, the way I got in touch with your dad is when he was a dealer through Paul Cable. When I was very first starting, he said, if you like old bikes, you got to meet this guy, Dale. I mean, he's got everything. And so I sought out Dale, called him, and said, is there any way that I can come and shoot your bikes? And he was, of course, like, Dale. He was like, yeah, come on down. We're going to... We're gonna rock and roll and I'll show you everything. So that was the beginning and I can't remember which piece it was, but. Yeah, I was gonna ask uh, you if you remember what that first one was. I don't remember. But there, I, there's I been think, dozens. Yeah, 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 I know, it goes so far back. Do you? I don't, I don't. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. we've got you know, several dozen pieces of yours here. I've been staring at these all weekend, drooling and trying to pick out my next yeah, one. I don't know, man. It was, it's got to, it was, I think, before Evelyn, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and well, we did a babe in 2009. We did Evelyn. Uh, those were right about the same time. And yeah. then, uh, yeah, gosh, as you guys go through the museum when you visit, you can see David's work absolutely everywhere. It's some of the most coveted motorcycle-inspired artwork and the aviation. And what else do you do? I mean... Um, well, I'm going to start doing some horses because my wife is really into horse, but... Um, just old Americana in general, trains, planes, automobiles, everything that was all from that that first, you know, through 1915 when they invented everything. Yeah. You know, it was yeah. like, that was my time, you know, I just loved that period. And yeah, everyone was an inventor and a mechanic and a scientist. And so, yeah, huge inspiration from that decade. Well, we're honored to have you here this weekend. I can't thank you enough for being here. Oh, my pleasure. I'll be back. I know our you visitors know are enjoying it, and, and I am myself. We had a great dinner last night, oh, yeah. and uh, thank you again, and look forward to catching up later on this we weekend as we roll back. around. Always something new here, too. All right. Well, we'll catch up. We're going to continue the tour. David Ewell, guys, make sure you check out his artwork, EwellStudios.com. Is that right, David? EwellStudios.com? Yeah. yeah. Guys, the best stuff in the world, guys. So, pleasure to have him here and uh, really excited. So we're gonna keep on rolling, firing motorcycles up here at the museum. It's hardly go, 10 minutes goes by that you don't hear something fire up and run. Now, before we crank up our next bike, I kinda wanna take you guys on a quick walk and show you exactly what this place is all about. So, you guys have heard me say it before, 375 of the world's rarest motorcycles 1903 all the way through geez the 70s and this place is all about rare motorcycles now as you go through the museum you see it's not linear how do you do sir it's nice to see you um as you go through the museum it's not linear so it's not like you walk in the front door and you start at that beginning age and you kind of walk through time 
as you roam, and let's go this way, we'll kind of take a backwards walk, keep you guys guessing when you come in the first time. So starting with the knucklehead era and, and you know, some of the most inventive time in American motorcycle history, that's circulating oil, high horsepower, overhead valves. Uh, as you move backwards this way, you've got one-of-a-kind motorcycles beyond compare. Here at the museum, I couldn't, never counted the amount of one-of-a-kind motorcycles, one-off examples that are here on display, but I'd say that it's likely in the dozens. Uh, this one's one of our favorites here at the museum, built, owned, and ridden by the co-founder of Indian. It's a 1913, it's an Indian prototype. It's got two of everything on the motorcycle, not another motorcycle like it in the world. In the far back corner over there, guys, uh, 1905 Yale, California. That bike is virtually identical to the first motorcycle to cross the United States. So first motorcycle actually did it. The motorcycle crossed the United States before the automobile did. Well, not a lot of people knew that. 1903, a guy named George Wyman, I think it was something like 50 something days coast to coast. So as you keep roaming through the museum, and again, we're going back, this guy's the world's rarest motorcycle, the Traub. Many of you guys have heard of the Traub bike. Bike was found behind a brick wall in the 1960s. We date the bike to about 1916. There's not another one like it in the world today. Um, nothing known, no, it never even was a Traub motorcycle company, but yet exists this highly refined motorcycle, different than anything of, of, of its era. No contemporaries like it. And uh, one of the prize pieces here at Wheels Through Time. The Homemade America exhibit, a lot of this stuff inspired with motorcycle engines. Uh, ways to make life a little easier, ways to make life a little more fun. You know, baby, baby cars with Harley Davidson engines, plows, tillers, jet skis, ice saws. Uh, stuff like this. this is pure Americana here and this is what, like just like a few minutes ago what David and I were touching on uh, this is the sort of stuff that was not produced in a factory it was done with American ingenuity so grandpa's old motorcycle leaned up against the shed bikes tired out but the engine still runs let's pull it out and make a mining cart or make a ice saw the tiller over there we actually a couple years ago guys got the tiller running on one of our shows <laughs> That one way in the back over there with the big fan blade on it uh, had a dead mag or no mag in it. So me and Chris slipped a new magneto in that thing and got it fired up and took it outside and went and tilled up the back 40. And uh, <laughs> Jerry, our groundskeeper, about kicked my butt. We tore the yard up and I don't think he's forgiven me since. But so here at the museum, guys, another big focus is racing. Uh, 150 racing motorcycles of the 375 or so bikes in the museum. Huge focus on racing. It's almost half the collection is made up of racing bikes of one sort or another. So from board track racing, which we're going to show you guys a few of those in a few minutes, uh, factory hill climbers. This is really one of the most colorful eras in American racing. One of the most little known eras. Uh, this is like depression era stuff where factories didn't have big budgets. Not a lot of folks had uh, budgets to even go visit races. You know, no, you know, this is the crunch of the depression. Um, 1932, 31, 30, really just kind of that high or, or peak era of American hill climbing. And the bikes on the hill here at Wheels Through Time, a lot of the rarest machines anywhere from serial number one Indian hill climbers, uh, prototype Harley overhead valve jobs, uh, going around that way, you've got one of fives and one of tens, one of ones, serial number ones. Uh, and of course, as you guys know, everything here is kept in running and operating condition. Um, as we roam back this way, more hill climbers. Uh, and as we get towards the board track racers, in between the hill climbers and the board trackers, guys, we've got some really cool racing examples from kind of the lesser known forms of racing. So scrambles, hare and hounds, speedway racing, and uh, a lot of these motorcycles, TT stuff, and the bikes under the pavilion here. Uh, some of my favorites inside the museum. Very low production stuff. 
you know, TT knucklehead and panhead race bikes. This is right before they realized that lighter is better. They had 80 cubic inch TT racing classes back then. These are two of the big bikes. So all your cla like class C flat track stuff, 45 cubic inch, light and nimble. These were the big guns, uh, machines up to 80 cubic inches, which is really pretty insane. If you can imagine muscle in that big pan head with a glide fork, all that weight around a, a TT race course, pretty incredible stuff. The Jack Pine Racers, 510 miles through Michigan with no roads. So these bikes were made for off-road enduro racing stuff. And again, guys like us take a factory bike, start making it, modifying it your way and turn it into a, a bike that's really set up uh, for the off-road, set up for trails, single track. The Speedway stuff, the early dirt track pea shooter stuff. You know, in the mid-20s, the big bikes were so fast that they just had to limit displacement. So you've got 1,000 cc motorcycles producing upwards of 50 plus horsepower, two inch skinny little tires, uh, inherent danger, you know. So in the mid 20s, they make that effort to limit displacement. And over on this side, you've got a, probably the best collection of what we call Harley pea shooters, 350 and 500 cc, smaller displacement race bikes. Uh, and a lot of this stuff you can't see anywhere else. Actually, probably six, seven months ago, our friend Paul Ozzy brought down a serial number one engine that we did a video on, guys. So if you check out the YouTube stuff often, there's actually a show on this engine right here, serial number one from 1931. Paul found it up in Connecticut, brought it down to the museum. Going to be a restoration project here uh, at some point in the future. So as we keep roaming the board track exhibit, and we'll just kind of view it from the outside here, guys. A lot of the bikes in the board track exhibit, this is, is some of the earliest, the earliest form of American track racing period. So these bikes were no brakes, no brain, or no brain, these guys, they didn't have brains. No, no brakes, no clutch, direct drive, 120 plus mile an hour motorcycles, some of these. So Thors, Harleys, Indians. Uh, there's actually one up top that's half Harley, half Indian. It's called a Westfield Flyer, way up there, the red and black one, combination of Harley and Indian. We actually just picked up a bike very similar to that small displacement at the Las Vegas auction. Excelsior, the big valve Excelsior here, one of my favorites. First bike to average 100 mile an hour on a one mile track for five miles. So that's way back in like 19, 1912 or 1913. That's a 1915, 16 example. Um, so as we go back this way guys now the board track racers a lot of what you see here you can't see them anywhere else in the world we've done tons of content on those bikes so if you get a chance subscribe check out more of the youtube shows you can kind of key in on some of those really early racing motorcycles from that first era uh, of american track racing so as we keep going guys original paint motorcycles one of the big focuses here at the museum is originality and there's probably more original condition motorcycles than you can see here or m m here than you can see anywhere else uh, in the world from uh, as raced machines like the the charlie jacobs hill climber here uh to motorcycle like our, cla our our 45 cubic cubic inch example or uh, cubic inch exhibit here at the museum numerous examples that are completely as they left the factory, 1948, 1949. Uh, as you get over this way, all the way back into like the late 1920s, most of the examples in this 45 cubic inch exhibit are original condition. Now the Harley Davidson 45, uh, for a long time, it was the longest running motor in the history of internal combustion, uh, up until the Sportster, I believe. So they produced these things continuously from 1929 to 1973, almost identical. Uh, throughout that whole period. Here at the museum, we've got one of almost every year. I'm still missing 37, missing 1951. So if you find any that era, call me. Uh, so missing two from that, that, uh, that span of the, the two wheelers. Yeah. Um, yeah. Guys, we hope you've been enjoying everything. Matt's getting ready to fire up another bite, but we wanted to talk to some of you guys and find out. So who have you said it was your, this is your first weekend here, right? It is. So tell me, tell me about where you're from. 
Uh, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. So what, what attracted you to Wheels Through Time? What brought you down here? I have been looking at these videos yeah. online for yeah. a couple of years. Yeah. Decided that we really had to make a visit down here. Yeah, we're glad, uh, glad you made there it. There are some terrific machines here. So have you, have you been disappointed in your time here? Not at all. Fantastic. You a fantastic. member this weekend, didn't you? Yeah, I did. <laughs> Thank you very much for your support, my friend. That's one of the things that keeps us going. You're welcome. Well, you appreciate you coming. Now, what about you? Uh, from Columbus, Ohio. First time here? Yeah. First so time tell, me, here. tell me what you think about your first visit. Uh, it's awesome. I got a chance to, to meet Matt you last night. You were here night. yesterday. I was. Yeah. I was. Yeah, you really impressed me. I, I actually had an opportunity to come to Wheels Through Time back in 2018, and I really wanted to get a chance to meet Dale. Uh, at the time, because I've, I, as you can tell, I, I've been to a lot of different places. I know Wayne, so uh, I was I was really hoping to get a chance to meet him. And I'm sorry that I missed him. Yeah. Missed, missed you him. would enjoy him. But he was a live wire. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, it's just really exciting to be here. You know, it just uh, some of the best motorcycles in the world right here. Yeah, fantastic. Well, listen, guys, we're so appreciative here. I'm gonna hand it back over to Matt. Rocking, guys. Well, it's fitting that you came today too, because Founders Day, we're celebrating my pops. A lot of his. Uh, you know his 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 lifetime of hard work is in here and uh it's our as a crew here uh it's our goal to continue to share this place and uh can hopefully instill that passion in others that that he instilled in us so uh incredibly excited that everybody's here today it's been an awesome weekend so far and we're firing up more rare motorcycles so i was telling you guys about the 45s one of the rarest 45 cubic inch motorcycles ever produced uh, was the Harley Davidson DAH and we were talking hill climbers on the other side of the hill guys and the bikes on the hill national champions like I said serial number ones as raced original condition machines uh, so in 1927 the AMA creates the 45 cubic inch class so prior to then they were all like 61 cubic inch bikes they had an 80 cubic inch class they had the smaller 350 classes that we looked at some of those bikes back that way in 27 they come out with a 45 cubic inch class um, at the time and basically what happens is when a manufacturer or two creates a new displacement of motorcycle the AMA creates a racing class for it because when you're racing that's how you're promoting your machines so when you win on Sunday you sell on Monday uh, Excelsior 1925 they create the super x uh i think way back in 1920 indian creates the scout i think that was in 600 and then shortly after 750 cubic inch or 750 uh, uh, uh cubic centimeters 750 45 used interchangeably uh, so harley davidson was late to the game all they made was 61s and they made those 350s and 500s and while they create this the ama creates this 750 class Harley's left to compete on a smaller displacement bike in the same class, non-competitive. Uh, and by 1930, they had factory engineered a special model specifically built for hill climbing. It was called the model DAH. And the DAH was a, a four cam, 45 cubic inch, overhead valve, dual port exhaust, alcohol burner like 16 to 1 compression every piece on the motorcycle was specifically built for hill climbing they only made 25 of these motorcycles so or 25 of the engines i should say so they may have maybe about 20 motorcycles and maybe some spare engines uh, 16 to 1 compression? yeah that one's high compression and it's got a ton of cam overlap so you can actually kick start it so um the dah like I said, 20, 25 of them produced. Uh, 1932, these bikes won the National Hill Climb Championship uh, at Mount Garfield. So some of the biggest names in Harley-Davidson racing, period, were astride these motorcycles. These two examples happen to be number nine and number 10 out of those 20, 25 produced. So uh, incidentally, they were found six months, my dad found these bikes six months apart, 100 miles apart, on the other side of the country so one was pretty torn up and dilapidated so they decided to restore it the other bike uh, they were able to revive and running and operate and keep it in running and operating condition and the bike is pretty much as raced so down to the original tires um, really really neat stuff and these bikes make some incredible noise i believe i've got fuel in this one so we're going to crank this one up today 
one of the rarest Harley Davidsons ever produced, guys. If, in fact, if you've been to the Harley Davidson Museum, has anybody been to the Harley Davidson Museum? So outside of the Harley Davidson Museum, they've got that 25 foot tall statue. That's one of these bikes, the Harley Davidson DAH. So um, I'm using my trusty don't let the float stick tool. Um, so incredible sound and it's not really what you think. You know, people see these early motorcycles and they think it's kind of going to be one of those put a putt, put a putt, put a putt things. Uh, this thing is a pretty serious piece of equipment. Uh, yeah, it's basically open headers, which is, you can hear the potency, but then the exhaust note with those really short pipes is a lot different than you'd even think it'd be. So this bike, um, we run rarely here at the museum, <laughs> maybe five or six times a year. So pretty special day today. And like I said, every piece of the motorcycle was specific to this bike and this bike only and was built just for Harley Davidson's hill climb, top riders, uh, best of the best. Guys like us, we couldn't even get bikes like this back then. So let's give it a couple kicks and see if she goes. All right, here we are. <laughs> oh man, that thing is incredible. And it, I mean, you're talking, it's like 50 plus horsepower. Oh yeah, I turned the fuel off. I gotta choke it and the kill switch is disconnected at the moment. So I just stick my hand over the carburetor and it pulls a bunch of fuel out and it's half of it's on my hand, half of it's on the floor right now. So, but like 50 horsepower and single speed transmission, magneto ignition, like I said, ultra high compression. It's got barrel racing carburetor, which is pretty much wide open or not. And uh, you can hear that throttle response. It's really potent. That weird, funky, kind of hollow exhaust sound. You know, now what's really neat about this bike is we, for, you know, it was 1930, so all the way through 2009 we kind of regarded these bikes only as hill climbers. It was only known and only documented that these bikes were hill climb, or these engines were used for hill climbing. And in 2009, we actually found a track racing example of one of these. It's kind of like the bike we dreamed about before we knew it existed. And uh, oh, board, tracks done. Board, tracks, board track style motorcycle. Board track is pretty much done. And that's really that. What's neat here is as you, as you visit the museum, like I said, it's not linear, but you start to roam around here and you can see how they got from point A to point B to point X or wherever we're at now. Um, certainly not at point Z because there's surely some development left in the motorcycle. But uh, that period there where they go from board track racing and it kind of slides into dirt track racing because the boards kind of fell into disrepair. It's a pretty dangerous sport, rough cut on untreated lumber you know so it's not going to last forever uh wooden surface is inherently limited in its lifespan so they kind of move into dirt track racing at a the time there's still a few board track racers left around and then that's when you see american hill climbing kind of make its rise in the mid-20s and 
by the time the depression hits, it's really the, 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 the big focus of the manufacturers was on this sport because again, maintaining a big two mile track, difficult to do uh, when money's tight. Manufacturers assembling these big factory teams and shipping them all over the country, these big races, difficult to do. Uh, so hill climbing becomes that next big sport and while the budgets weren't big, factory poured huge resources, uh, you know, time, manpower, uh, into creating some of these rarest motorcycles anywhere produced, uh, you know, ever. And, uh, there's one-of-a-kind machines. Uh, these are just a, a handful of these left. Uh, only known example, early 1924. So that's like really from about the beginning uh, of American hill climbing. And as you get that way, you've, both of these are 61 cubic inch examples. And then, you know, hill climbing was a big sport all the way into... I mean, it still is today, but you see that big manufacturer support all the way into the 40s and the, like the, the San Marina bike around that way, the WR, 1946 uh, WR 47, and San Marina won the National Hill Climb Championship on that bike uh, also. So uh, incredibly proud to have this collection of motorcycles here. It was one of Dale's first passions or one of Dale's early passions was those American hill climbing bikes. And, you know, something like this would almost never be able to be replicated today uh, because the bikes have been found. You know, there's only so many of them out there. So even to uh, establish another collection like this, it was virtually impossible, if not impossible, because the bikes just aren't out there. Um, so, Matt, yes, ma'am. What's the story behind the prosthetic? Behind the leg? Uh, ah, yeah. you know what? It's just like a running joke around here. We, uh, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we uh, you know what? I don't know where the leg came okay, from. Okay, I wonder but if we, like the person on the bike fell and ended up losing his leg and that was That leg. may have happened at some you point. You know, my dad actually got the leg from our friend Rocky Halter. And Rocky, my dad was up picking a 1908 Indian and a 1911 Indian from our friend Rocky, lives in Ohio. Uh, the leg was in the pile of stuff, so the deal they made, the leg went with it. So we move it here and keep it bouncing around on different oh. bikes. So. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> we don't have any fun around here, as you Find can the tell. Leg. Find the leg. So, yeah, guys, hill climbers rare as they get as you move on some of the memorabilia here inside wheels through time is second to none um you know a lot more than just motorcycles i showed you some of the homemade america stuff briefly one of the prize pieces in our homemade exhibit is the wilson miller light plane the airplane up there uh last year we actually were feeling irresponsible and decided let's get this thing outside and we fired it up and taxied it across the parking lot so that was exciting, and we'll never do it again. Yeah, I, don't, I, think, I think terrifying was more of the, the appropriate term. <laughs> yeah, that was intense, and I'm definitely no pilot. That's for sure. I didn't, you know, I don't, you know, know nothing about aviation. I tend to be a two wheels on the ground type of guy, but. It has a Harley Davidson JD engine, so we figured, what the heck, let's give it a shot. But yeah, so a lot more than just motorcycles here, guys. In the memorabilia, there's more than you can see here in 100 visits. Uh, the deeper you look, the more you see. There's, you know, original signage and advertising from Harley Davidson. Like the 1926 Harley Davidson billboard on the back of the teen shop here. Uh, uh, you know, original insurance advertisements auto and, and, and gas and petroleum stuff, uh, tire signs, gas pumps. I mean, no kidding, the deeper you look, the more you see. My dad was one of those guys, he was just passionate about everything early Americana. Uh, and over his years was able to really dig up some, uh, some stuff that you just can't see anywhere else. This building is absolutely filled with it. 38,000 square feet. Um, and I feel like we're running out of room, but at the same time, we could probably squeeze another 100 bikes in here. So we're going to keep collecting and keep moving this place forward. Uh, let's go on and keep checking out some more motorcycles. Come on with us, guys. So the 45 exhibit, and again, guys, we're going backwards here through the museum. Usually as you come in, uh, you kind of start over in one spot and ease through the building. There's a big horseshoe with 
you know, spots to weave in and out. Chopper graveyard, uh, some ultra cool choppers from kind of the one of the first eras in motorcycle customization. Uh, the military exhibit here at the museum. Uh, some of the rarest military models anywhere in the world. Uh, you know, Harley Davidson in the military. Maybe they made 80 or 90,000 vehicles. The WLAs, they made absolutely a ton of them, 70,000 machines. Uh, original condition examples here at the museum. Uh, Air Force example here, restored at the museum. Over this way, you've got one of the rarest bikes in the collection. That's a 1941 Harley Davidson shaft drive knucklehead trike. Actually, our pal David immortalized this bike in one of the, the paintings back that way. What's that one called again? Strategic Maneuvers. Strategic Maneuvers. Is it? It actually has those graphics on it, so I had to be careful how I reproduce it. Yeah. <laughs> so the, T, the TA's got a great history here at the museum, too. Yeah, and it's such a, such a rare bike. They made 17 of those motorcycles. That happens to be the prototype, the Canadian prototype. So they made 17, 16 for the US, one for Canada. And that was the, uh, I believe the first of the shaft drive examples. They made one chain drive and then they made the shaft drive ones. And I think that's the first of those shaft drive bikes to be produced, uh, rests in original condition. Uh, my dad found that bike in maybe the mid 1980s, 86, 87. Uh, got the bike running and riding again. I remember me and him used to jump on this thing and I'd climb in the back and we'd bounce around swap meets picking up motorcycle parts and shoving them in the back. And um, this thing's been to a lot of antique motorcycle club meets, picked up a lot of rare parts. A lot of those rare parts are probably on motorcycles in the museum uh, today. So. Uh, one of my favorites here at the museum, just because I can remember being four, five, six years old uh, riding around on the back of it. So everything runs, even the ones that don't look like they run. So one of my favorites exhibits, and, and this is the same, one of my, my dad's favorites uh, here at the museum was the, the Shaber Cycle Shop. So that teens era for Harley Davidson, the 19 teens, is when you see Harley start to pull away from a lot of the other manufacturers and 150 different motorcycle manufacturers back then, uh, maybe even more. And by the teens, it's whittling down because all sorts of factors, you know, you've got distribution, you've got cost of production, economic factors, you've got the quality of the product. Uh, so in the teens, you really start to see Harley moving ahead and pulling away from a lot of the others. Uh, by the late teens, it's Harley, Indian, and Excelsior pretty much. Those are the big three. So the collection of bikes around the Shaber's shop, now there's 34 brands of motorcycles here inside of the museum. And this is that era where uh, we really focus on originality. So there's restored motorcycles throughout, but the original motorcycles here at the museum, the ones around the teen shop are among the most special. Uh, 1912 all the way through 1920 or so for Harley Davidson original condition bikes, uh, very rare models. Uh, the 1919 over there that you're checking out right now, uh, is actually a factory racing engine stuffed into a road model chassis. It's the only known example of one of those. Uh, very rare bike. The 15 here uh, was one that my dad rode often. Uh, that's a single speed 1915 Harley Davidson. The 16, you drive that one from the sidecar. So uh, a big favorite here uh, amongst the staff and among the visitors. That bike was designed to drive from inside of the, the car. There never was a seat on the bike. If you look, you could never even sit on the bike. It's a specially made uh, to be driven from inside of the hack. So the bikes around the Shaber shop here, almost all original condition motorcycles, 1918, 1917, the Messenger Pigeon Carrier. Uh, so uh, very rare motorcycles and bikes that are really among the most original motorcycles anywhere in the world. So 34 brands. Uh, it's really just a scratch of American motorcycle production back in the pre-teens and the 19-teens. So uh, one of those off-brands that we love here, and again, one of the bikes that was, uh, you know, my dad really had a close connection with is our 1937 Hemihead Crocker. We're going to crank that bike up real shortly. Now, 
of those 34 brands here, all of 34 are in runnable and operable condition. Now the Crocker, for those of you guys that have been fans of Wheels Through Time for a long time, I bet you probably remember, my dad used to fire that Crocker up and take it to the back and do burnouts uh, down the main aisle that we were just walking down there. So Crockers were made in Los Angeles, 72 examples produced from 1936 to 42. So among the rarest uh, and most desirable motorcycles anywhere in the world, kind of considered the holy grail of American motorcycle production. So this, uh, kind of referred to as Dale's Burnout Special. This is like the, one of the most famous crockers anywhere because it's probably had that rear wheel lit up more times than, than, uh, than any of them. So crockers are made in Los Angeles and I think it's like a 1300 square foot factory. You know, everything's hand built. A guy named Al Crocker uh, produced these in Los Angeles from 36 to 42. It's factory super bikes. I mean, this is like guy offered a guarantee he said if you get beat on one of my bikes by a harley or an indian you get your money back and as far as we know he never had to give any money back so faster more agile more maneuverable sturdier than your harley or indian of the same day uh, you see those crocker rocker boxes uh, that indicates the hemi head now they made parallel valves and they made hemis of the 72 bikes just 28 of them were hemis so this particular example uh, is the small tank model, Hemi head model, um, likely one of the most desirable American motorcycles anywhere in the world. I'm not sure exactly how many of those 28 are known today. Uh, so we're gonna get this bike fired up now. Until this morning, this bike hadn't run in like maybe, maybe eight or nine months. So uh, we got it fired up and uh, had a leaky fuel line, so I actually had to re-solder the fitting on the fuel line. We put a little oil in it, put a little gas in it, and it fired up. Now, the sound of a crocker is unlike anything else you've heard. And we've, yeah, that, that DAH back there is pretty potent, but for a road model bike, uh, this thing is so crisp, and you, you more than hear it, you know, you, you like feel it when when it revs so um one of our favorites let's go ahead and see if we can fire it up so we got fuel on and like i said ultra heavy duty single down tube cast aluminum oil tank or gas and oil tank so you've got gas on this side gas in the back oil up in the front a uh, really sturdy double spring girder fork on this one and this is just like the most if you ask me if you ask a lot of people it's the most styly just bad to the bone looking motorcycle that was ever produced and uh crockers today uh incredibly sought after some of the highest priced american motorcycles or motorcycles period anywhere in the world and this example is number 22 so it's number 22 out of the 28 hemispherical combustion chamber ones uh produced and capable of speeds well over 100 miles an hour all the way back in 1936 so okay here we go couple prime kicks oh, there we go oh come on don't do it to me making me work for it all right choke back off a lot of compression you can you can feel the compression yeah
So there you go, guys. That's one of the world's rarest motorcycles, period. Every time you fire that thing up, it's just a thrill because the, the sound and the, I mean, you can just feel the horsepower. Crocker did a lot similar to Harley, but did a lot of things different and a lot of things better. And uh, after World War II, they, these bikes were made in such limited production um, that it just wasn't cost effective to do. And then after World War II, uh, Crocker, Crocker actually ceased production in 42 all civilian production in World War II or during World War II was stopped and after the war just never continued production. So uh, first American super bike, there you have it guys. And uh, one of the most special bikes here at the museum. My dad got this bike from a good, uh, a, a good pal, his antique motorcycle collector in Southern California by the name of Richard Morris. Uh, Richard was a, still is, uh, you know, kind of a, a, I mean, he's a collector of all sorts of motorcycles and has owned a lot of the rarest motorcycles out there. And uh, the number 22 Crocker uh, has been here in the Wheels Through Time collection, built here in Illinois since 1990, maybe 1996. So, that's the burnout bike. That's the burnout bike. I see the tracks are getting pretty thin over there. They're getting thin, but we're repopulating little by little. I'm just not doing it on that bike. So the stakes are pretty high with that one. So, um, I was lucky enough to see one. Did you see one? Oh, yeah. Man, he used to light that thing up. It's 105 feet long. I walked it off one time, 105 foot long strip of rubber on the ground. Now, many of you guys that have been to wheels through time, it's one of the things it's unforgettable. You know, you knew when you heard the Crocker well, fire up. I don't know if the time when the, the long run came through here. Yeah. And that was full of people. When he did it. And it was, uh, like I said, there was people, this many people just lined up right on the side. Both sides of the aisle. He's Crazy. six feet in between everybody and in between the two sides of the aisle. And he'd and uh, yeah, it's over the years, the burnout strips gotten walked off on well, people's I just shoes. Went up and, there and I saw there's not much of it left. No, it was less though, because we started doing a few again. Oh, well, have you? Yeah, we have. So not on the Crocker. We use a couple flatheads, a couple knuckleheads, um, panhead every once in a while, and uh, we're trying to trying to repopulate back? it. But I don't know if it'll ever be as black as, as it was as black time. as it was at one time. So. <laughs> Yeah, pretty neat stuff. So we're continuing to restore motorcycles here at Wheels Through Time. Uh, it's one of the things that we get into the most is continuing to preserve the history, digging up new projects, uh, taking them to the restoration shop and getting them fired up and uh, bringing this stuff back to life. So of the 375 motorcycles here on display, there's probably another 20 in the shop moving along in different phases. Uh, one of the bikes that we just finished here inside of the museum is this 1929 uh, Harley Davidson JDH. And uh, I kind of built this bike as a tribute bike uh, uh, to my dad. And uh, you know, my dad and I bonded a lot over restoring these motorcycles. Uh, spent a lot of time in that shop. Uh, together, I can remember when I first started working at Wheels Through Time, we were, you know, in the museum at 7 and 7.30 in the morning. We'd spend time in here sharing history, spending time hanging out with visitors all day, cranking up motorcycles. And uh, when the museum would close down, uh, I lived in the cabin out back or out, out front. My dad's house is out back. We'd go both mow down dinner real quick for 15 minutes and then meet back in the restoration shop. and. We always called it the six to midnight gig, restoring the motorcycles and um, probably more like six to three in the morning, but um, we, uh, we got a lot done back then. And again, I, I, I'd just been here a little less than 20 years now. So he had been doing this his whole life, working that way, um, you know, getting done with work during the day and going to the restoration shop and pouring the passion into reviving these old motorcycles. It was what he lived for. Um, and I was very fortunate to spend a ton of time with him uh, as I grew into an adult doing the same sort of thing. And uh, a, a lot of that time, um, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, a period in my life that I look 
look back on the most fondly because we spent a ton of time together and got some incredible thrills. Some of the funnest bikes that we messed with and some of the, the, the neatest motorcycles that we had back in that shop were some of the early American racing bikes. And Harley Davidson in 1924 uh, debuted their FH model. And here at the museum, the board track racers and the hill climbers Harley Davidson's top machines at that time both were based on that platform. So more of those bikes here than you can see probably anywhere else in the world. Uh, and those bikes would come through that restoration shop and to get them running for the first time and hear one of those racing motorcycles run uh, that maybe hadn't run since the 1920s or 1930s is no feeling like it. Uh, the FH model was such a successful bike that in 1928 and 29 Harley created a road model version for visitors so or for excuse me for for uh, customers uh, basically huge success on the racing platform and this is a period where the racing stuff was so far removed from road model stuff uh, that in 28 and 29 the 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 public's like hey Harley we want we want one of those it was a two cam uh, high horsepower a pocket valve, three speed. So Harley in 28, 29 goes to making the model JDH. Um, as many of those FHs and JDHs that uh, my dad and I worked on together, the most recent JDH that I found uh, started with a pair of engine cases. Uh, the second I found the cases, I knew that I wanted to build them into a, a bike that I could you know, have fond memories of my pops with. So the, the bike at hand, we just finished. We actually did a some programming on our YouTube channel about this motorcycle. Now the Harley Davidson 2 cam, rare as rare gets. They only made 500 of these engines in 28 and 29. And like the Crocker, these are some of the most sought after American motorcycles uh, anywhere. High horsepower for the era. This period in time, these bikes are, you know, the JDs, the single cams, maybe 3,000 RPM motorcycles, 3,500 on the higher side. These are like 5,000, 5,500 RPM machines. So they absolutely honk. Uh, Harley Davidson basically through their race program in the early 20s exposed the weaknesses in those early designs, corrected them with the two cams, uh, and it took several more years to, and then for them to implement that into the, the road model version. So we just finished this one up. It's a special low slung factory racing chassis. So it's a European export road racer chassis. In the US they're dealing with track racing and you've got hill climbing. Hill climbing has a transmission but it's a single speed. So they need a clutch because they're starting from a stop but it's one speed bike. The board trackers were no brakes and no clutch, direct drive, they didn't even have a transmission. In Europe, the big sport was road racing. So road racing, you need three speeds with they had to use more if they had the technology at the time, but they used the three-speed transmissions, but they made these special frames, and there's probably only a handful of these Harley-Davidson uh, export road racing frames known. Uh, Keystone racing frames, so it's the engine, there's no belly underneath this engine of the frame, no belly. Uh, it's tied together with engine plates. Uh, the transmission's housed right behind that. Everything's ultra low. And then you look the whole bike other than the handlebars uh, is barely midway up my, my leg here and I'm no tall guy. Um, so 18 inch wheels, uh, little short fenders. Now I wanted to build this bike as a street bike. The road racing bikes in Europe, magneto ignition, no headlights, no tail lights stripped bare bones made strictly for the purpose uh, i wanted to ride this bike on the street so instead of a magneto ignition i built it with a generator distributor coil battery box underneath the seat uh, that way i could power the headlights the horn the tail light and perfectly street legal motorcycle and it's a pretty potent machine so we're going to crank this one up it makes some really good noise guys and this is one of those eras when you see these bikes you tend to you get this visualization or, or you get this idea that you know it's just kind of a putt 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 motorcycle um, and these things may quite the power actually the harley toucan platform in 1920 or 1937 so nine years after they stopped producing this bike and stopped producing these engines 
uh, they were still dominating on the speed circuits. So a lot of the land speed stuff that they do back then in speed trials, this engine would dominate even the bikes from the early 30s and the mid 30s. The Harley Davidson VLs, big 74 and 80 cubic inch flatheads, and then the Harley Knucklehead, which is famous for horsepower. Uh, the Harley JDHs were actually faster than those bikes. So in 1937, the AMA outlawed these motorcycles from competition use, so um, too fast. So Harley kind of goes to the AMA and they say, hey, we need you to nip this in the bud because we're not selling our new motorcycles or maybe they were selling their new motorcycles, but this was raising some question as to what was actually the best. So like I said, some of the most sought after Harley Davidson's out there, period, the JDHs and uh, really proud to have this one back together so a couple prime kicks now when we ran this on our video most recently we had a couple ticks and it just wasn't running perfect and since uh chris and i took uh this front spark plug out pulled the points cap simple fixes runs perfect now so potent bike and it really neat is that 19 like 1936 fastest speed ever attained by a Harley Davidson 2 cam uh, JDH is 127 miles an hour if you can imagine that so absolute ton of power not a lot of moving parts in these lower ends so uh, it's one of the things that made them fast and didn't have a circulating oil pump like the knuckleheads you, know, you get that oil pump and it's drag even though they're making more maybe more compression, better airflow. You got that drag of that oil pump and these things are pretty much drip, 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 drip. It's a pretty free system. Very, very uh, potent engine, ton of fun to ride. And uh, one of the most iconic Harley Davidsons anywhere. So here at the museum, guys, second, third day open, third day. Yeah, third day open, it's Saturday. We're just getting our season kicked off. We've had an incredible time so far. We've had some great visitors from all over the country. I think uh, met some folks from California yesterday, some folks from Alaska, uh, new friends, old friends alike. Uh, one of the things about this museum, one of the things that makes this museum so special is that it is entirely funded through our visitors. So it's you guys that make this place happen. Uh, so 50, 50 plus years of collecting uh, that my dad did and when he decided to open the museum uh, to the public, uh, initially uh, the museum was behind his Harley Davidson dealership. We moved here in 20, or excuse me, in 2001. Uh, and since we've had over a million and a half visitors, clo getting close to 1.7 million visitors uh, through the door. So um, you guys are the folks to make this happen. We wouldn't be able to do what we do uh, without our visitors. We have. Uh, our lifetime members right now. You guys just became lifetime members this weekend. Uh, our lifetime members, we've got over 1,300 members that help keep this place going. Uh, some of our most uh, loyal patrons and 
I, I can't thank you guys enough for everything that you do for the museum. The other big thing that keeps this museum going, and I know a lot of you guys have participated in this, is our annual raffle. So the raffle bike here at the museum, started in 2001, my dad actually built a, excuse me, 2002, my dad actually restored a motorcycle, a classic bike specifically to be raffled. Hey, how are you? Nice to see you. Um, specifically to be raffled to one lucky winner. So here at the museum, we've given away 21 motorcycles. And this year coming up, it's gonna be actually our raffles in November every year. So for 2023, our raffle bike is this 1937 Harley Davidson knucklehead. So every year we try and one up the last year. We wanna bring a bike to our raffle that somebody can get on ride the wheels off of, have absolute years and thousands of miles of fun. Uh, this 1937 Harley was built just for that. So finished off in real sleek silver, gold and, and silver leaf decal here, silver and black with the gold striping, 18 inch wheels, Harley Davidson's famous 37 knucklehead engine. Now the knucklehead, I mean, it's the, it's the grandfather of the American motorcycle. You know, it's, it's the, or of the modern motorcycle. It doesn't matter what you're riding today, this engine in part made it what it is today. So uh, second 37 knucklehead in a row that we've raffled off. Uh, this one runs like it was brand new. So far we got 12, 14 miles on it. Uh, so we're just getting it shaken down. Uh, top to bottom rebuild inside the, the restoration shop. So started with an engine. I actually got this motor from our pal Mike Wolf on American Pickers and uh, started assembling parts last year and uh, tore the engine down, uh, rebuilt it from the ground up. So right from the crank pin, uh, this thing has been fit and finished just like as if it was new and uh, four-speed transmission. This year we set it up with the short hot rod bobber fenders and the Flanders handlebars. This thing is made to be ridden. So last motorcycle for the day that we're gonna crank up. You guys can win it, you guys can win it. Make sure you get your tickets. Like I said, it's one of the things that supports this museum more than anything else. Without our raffle and our raffle contestants, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. Whole wall of, of, of folks here that have won our previous bikes. Uh, some of my favorites are 46 seven knuckle we did in 2010 uh the 36 we did in 2011 actually our pal david who's here immortalized this one in a painting called autumn knuckle um, the 36 that our pal charlie woodward won tom roar he's one of our lifetime uh, donors tom won the 48 panhead uh, last year we did the t uh, uh Venetia, venetian delphine blue and uh, antique red 37 knuckle and we got the silver one this year. So you guys are gonna hear it run. We're gonna fire this thing up. Thank you guys for getting tickets. Thank you for being here today. You guys, we're having an awesome week and it's thanks to you guys. So appreciate everything. Let's crank it up. All right. Here we go. November 18th, guys, get your tickets. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you come and visit. 
Get to on a wheel time.com. Get tickets for the 37 Knucklehead. Check out our lifetime membership program. Come visit the museum and meet all these awesome people that work here too. By the way, guys, these are the folks that make it happen every day at the museum. We wouldn't be able to do what we do without our crew. We got the best crew anywhere. Tracy's birthday's coming up. <laughs> we got Daphne and Wendy and Elena over there. She's new to the crew this year and so is Stephanie. Make sure you come into the museum, introduce yourself. Don't be a stranger and see what this place is all about. Catch up with you next time. All right, guys.